Okay, if you have your Bibles, and I trust you do, this is a Bible class, it is a Bible church. And as we looked last week, we uh, got to the first two points, and everybody, I appreciate it. So many people said, please finish it up next week, preach, or, or preach more. And just, uh, you know, we really enjoyed uh, what you shared with us. And so I appreciated the encouragement. And uh, uh, I mean, especially the fact that you're wanting to come back and finish it up, or try to finish it up, I'll put it that way. So we want to go ahead and we're talking about faith overcomes difficulties. And so many times we, we look at difficulties as you know, just really serious problems instead of opportunities. And difficulties are opportunities so that God can shine in our life and uh, help others to see him working in and through us. And so I trust as we share with you tonight that this will be a help and encouragement to you. And so as we get into our message here, uh, like if we look at Job just briefly, Job chapter 1, verse 21, and then also Job 42, verse 10. And actually, I'm just going to give a portion of those verses at this time, uh, but you're uh, welcome to look there if you want to. And I want to see that losses lead to richer gifts through faith. And many times we, we fail to realize uh, that many times things that seem bad, and that maybe, uh, I can put it this way, maybe the devil means it for evil, means it for bad in your life, and then God can take it and do it for good if we take it in the right way. And those difficulties can become opportunities to serve and let people see Jesus in our life. And so in Job chapter 1, verse 21, it says, The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. And many times I've heard preachers use this at funerals. I've used it, I guess, a few times myself. But simply, Job was talking about all that he had lost. He had lost his wealth. He had lost his, his family. He had lost, you know, just going down the list, all the things that happened to him. And the way it happened to him, it was very clear that it was some sort of judgment. Uh, because it just uh, it was more than a coincidence. I mean, he had a... A really bad, 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 bad day. I mean, it's just one night after another, and you keep thinking it can't get any worse, and it continued to get worse. And Job made that profound statement. He was a very, very godly man, Job was. But he made the statement, he said simply, the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken. And that's what we need to realize, that any good thing that we have has come from God. I mean, really, every good thing it says in James chapter 1, verse 27, that every good thing cometh down from the Father of lights. And so what a blessing when we can look at things from that angle. And so as he said it, then he said something that we don't like to hear because when he, he said the rest of it, and the Lord hath taken away. <laughs> now, uh, I don't know about you, but I, I, I like gifts, you know what I'm saying? And I don't particularly like paying money out. Uh, Martha and I have all day been dealing with a problem. Uh, our church, uh, we got a bill for $5,663 on a credit card that we didn't possess. And so that's kind of weird. And uh, so we tried to figure it out, uh, what was going on, and it was buying Zeus. Anybody know what Zeus is? Yeah, I don't know if it's a false god, but yeah, so our church is apparently buying a false god, I guess, Zeus. Uh, but anyhow, so we tried to take care of it when it first happened, it was back on the 24th of April. And so we contacted, said, we don't have this card. This isn't even one of, our, one of our cards. So we don't understand why we're getting this bill and this notice. So please, you know, uh, turn it off. It's, it's, we don't want it. You know, so they gave us that warning. And so we thought that was that. Well, Friday, guess what? We got a new credit card and it had that number on it. <laughs> and they said, well, we did a brand conversion. And they said all of the city business cards were all changed is what we call a brand conversion. So I, I said, well, it's weird because we got a brand new credit <coughs> card in March, you know, and it's supposed to be good until 27, uh, you know, 2027. So, you know, we're going back and forth over all of that. But, you know, what I'm saying after about well, it was over three and a half hours, wasn't it, Mom? Uh, being on the phone, we finally, and, and everybody I talked to, they spoke English, but it was like, I think what they do is they get a, a can, and they go, can you hear me now? You know, and, and when they talk, the, but there's like a, I don't know, an echo or something other, and 
I know they're speaking English, but I have, I really can't tell exactly what they're saying. Really, really hard to say the least. And so anyhow, that was really, really aggravating. But you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, if, if we had gotten $5,663, I probably wouldn't have called right away, you, you know, if we had received it. <laughs> you know? But when it's taken away from you, it gets your attention, you know what I'm saying? And so hopefully we got it worked out. They're supposed to the cut it off, and they're going to send us another brand new car, okay? And anyhow, so we'll see what happens uh, after all that, that we went through. But what I'm saying is, Job said that God had given me all good things, and the Lord knows what to take. And folks, that's what we need to realize, that God, he's not sitting in heaven, and as I mentioned Zeus a moment ago, he's not sitting in heaven and got thunderbolts ready to just get out of step so I can get you. Just a, oh, good, you know, God's not that way. He's totally the opposite. God's looking for every opportunity he can to bless us, folks. I'm so glad I don't get what I deserve. Aren't you glad you don't get what you deserve? And God is so good to us. But Job can honestly say, the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. And so when we can see our difficulties, our problems that way, and see our blessings that way, that, that God's one does it. But notice what it says in chapter 42, verse 10. Again, just a portion of the verse. And here's what it says. And also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. <laughs> now, isn't that neat? Uh, that God doubled everything that he had. Now, it's kind of interesting because if you look at it, you see that God gave him twice as many sheep, twice as many donkeys, twice as many camels, and twice as many servants, and all these things. And I think he still had just one wife. But, but anyhow, but of all things, he got the same number of children. But it emphasizes that his daughters were the most beautiful women of that day and time. I mean, it definitely says that. But you ready? God didn't double them. But, but the, he did double them, but he didn't. What I said is his other children died, but he knew where they were. He knew they were in heaven with the Lord, if you please, in paradise, I should say. And so uh, as a result, they weren't gone because they were still in existence. And so God gave him that many more children. So his children were actually doubled. So really exciting as we look at Job that because of his faith, you please, God was able to make him even richer and give more to him through all his troubles and through all his trials. Isn't it funny that the men had come and had judged him and everything and had made, uh, you know, had just said, hey, let's face it, you've done something wrong. God would not do all these terrible things to you because God's just not that way. And he said, well, I don't know why God's done this, but he's done it for a reason. And I'm just gonna trust him. He, he giveth, he taketh. It's all his business because I belong to him. I'm his servant. Whatever he wants to do, so be it. And I will bless him. Even when bad things happen, I'll still bless God. It's a whole lot easier blessing when things are going good, isn't it? But we need to learn to bless him in every situation, just as Job did. What a tremendous example Job has become to so many people in this world. And so when I think of problems as they come our way, uh, when I think of trials and troubles, I have a little list here. Uh, someone once said, a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. Man, I thought that was pretty clever. I wish I'd have thought of it, but anyhow. Uh, but isn't that true? And then the next one. By affliction, the Lord separates the sin that he hates from the soul that he loves. That's pretty profound too, isn't it? And then, I dare say, that the greatest earthly blessing that God can give to any of us is health, with the exception of sickness. And folks, think about it. How many times through sickness have we been brought even closer to God during those times of sickness? And we've learned that when we are sick, that we can trust Him. When a loved one's sick, that we can trust Him that he knows what he's doing, and we can truly draw closer to him during that time. If Joseph had not been Egypt's prisoner, he would have never been Egypt's governor. The iron chains about his feet ushered in the golden chains about his neck. And what a blessing when you think of 
Joseph and all the trials and testings that he went through and how that he became a wonderful picture of Jesus Christ and uh, what Jesus Christ would do for us. And then God does not waste suffering. If he plows it, it is because he purposes a crop. So again, when things happen, and uh, oftentimes Martha and others will verify this, that many times we have seen more decisions made, we've seen more people come to know Christ as Savior at a funeral. We've seen just a, a tremendous number of people that have come to know Christ because of a death of a, a, of a loved one or a friend or whatever. And because of that, it was like, in one sense, like their fields were plowed and that they were ready for seed because they saw just how frail this life can be and how important it is to be ready for the life after we step out of this one. And so those something else. Smooth seas do not make skillful sailors. Okay. <laughs> and again, uh, that's an old African proverb, okay? A sick bed often teaches more than a sermon. And folks, I'm not praying for you to get sick so you can get a better sermon at home than here, okay? <laughs> and that was uh, also said before, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, face? FaceTime, Face internet, and uh, all that, all that other stuff. Okay, but anyhow, moving along, there's something else to think about. Times of trouble have often been times of triumph to a believer. Suffering seasons have generally been sifting seasons in which the Christian has lost his shaft and the hypocrite his courage. And then one last thought. God's rod is a pencil to draw Christ's image more distinctly upon us. And so there's a few thoughts, if you please. Uh, uh, Paul Harvey used to say, and there's the rest of the story for you, whatever. And uh, that's what I want to just share with you, those simple thoughts concerning uh, troubles and trials that we go through. And realize that God brings them into our life for a reason, to help us and to help us to be a blessing to others. I appreciate my daughter, Hannah, for many reasons. And, uh, but when she recently lost her baby here back in March, um, it, it, of course, it, it really troubled her. And of course, it troubled all of us. We were looking forward to having another grandson, <laughs> another grandchild. And uh, we were very excited. She was very excited. And as you know, we announced it here. And then the next day we found that she lost a baby and they hadn't announced it to their church. But Hannah, she went through a long process of them finally uh, taking care of the, the unborn baby. And uh, after that process, about, I wanna say two and a half weeks of trying to get rid of everything, so to speak, she just said, you know, Dad, I look at it this way. I found out that a lot of mothers have lost their babies and God's allowed this to happen to me so I can bring comfort to them so that I can help because I can say, I've been where you've been. I've had that happen to me too. And I thought, wow, she's got the right attitude, doesn't she? Uh, what a blessing. And that's my baby girl. But anyhow, moving along. What I'm trying to say, it is exciting when we can see things. And sometimes we, we don't always, if you please, well, many times we don't know what God's doing. And we probably won't even know until we get to heaven. And I'm afraid that many times we'll get to heaven, we'll go, who cares, we're here, you know? And we won't even worry about those names. We'll go, oh man, that was so silly, forget it. And our questions will be all answered when we find ourselves in the presence of the Lord. So faith again, as we looked at uh, the story of Job here again, as he emphasized that his faith, he became even richer than he was before. And by the way, when all these things struck him, he was the richest man in the East. I mean, he was very, very wealthy. And of all things, God doubled everything that he had uh, to show again that he was his man. And we know something else. When we talk about faith as it overcomes difficulties, poverty leads to a richer life through faith. And the scriptures, it says this, and again, this is in James 2, 5. It says, hearken my beloved brethren, and James was the half-brother of Jesus. Can you imagine being, 
the, the half brother or the, the half sister of Jesus. And I don't know if Mary and Joseph ever did anything like this, but they maybe said something like this. James, why can't you be more like your older brother Jesus? What's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, I mean, Jesus truly was the perfect son. And uh, it's interesting that uh, uh, James and Jude, they, they came to know Christ after the death of Christ. Isn't that interesting? Because they lived with Jesus, but later they became believers. And of course, James became the first pastor of well, uh, one of the first pastors at the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem there. But what am I trying to say? Simply, James, as he's pinning this horse here, James deals a whole lot with troubles and trials and difficulties that we go through. And as we look here in this verse, he says simply, hearken my beloved brethren. And so now uh, the believers in Christ have become his beloved brethren. And of all things, like I said, he became a pastor. And we see that God used them in a wonderful way. But he said, Hath not God chosen the poor of this world? Now, isn't it interesting? Because so many other people, if you please, in the world, uh, and, and when I say leaders in the world, they're looking for rich people. Uh, can you phone them? It's my campaign. <laughs> can you give me this or that? I've gotten so many uh, people asking for money. Um, and just, I mean, I get tons of letters all the time. People want money. And so very, very worthy cause, but you can only do so much, you know what I'm saying. But simply, he said, God hath called the poor. I don't know about y'all, but I can identify being poor. <laughs> I don't know if, if y'all can, but I'm talking about financially poor, but isn't it amazing that even though we're financially poor, we can be spiritually very wealthy. And in many sense, far more wealthier than a very, very wealthy billionaire, if you please. But as we read on that verse, it says, Hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith? You see, what happens is the rich person says, Well, I, I can trust my money. I can trust my treasures. I can trust my, my position. I can trust all those things. And I can take care of myself. And the poor man on the other side, and here's the thing, the rich man doesn't realize he really needs God's help. And even though he may say, I'm a self-made man, you know, of course his wife might differ with him a little bit, but anyhow, I'm a self-made man. But I don't care how wealthy you are, we all need God. And we all need God's help. And sometimes we need God's help more than <laughs> when we think that we don't need his help. We really need his help then. But simply, James went on and he said this. He's chosen the poor of, of this world, rich in faith. And so God shows a, I, I don't want to say necessarily a preference, but he shows that he, he really thinks highly of those that are poor because they have a faith to trust him, to see him in any situation. And he says, and heirs of the kingdom, which he had promised to them that love him. He ties in that word heirs. Uh, and, and when I think of that, how many people, I, I think I saw a, a sticker, I think it was in California at the time. <laughs> uh, the bumper sticker said, I got my money the old fashioned way. And then it said, I inherited it. <laughs> and, uh, folks, uh, you understand that we have to die to receive our inheritance because when we die, we step into God's presence and the kingdom of heaven becomes truly our kingdom and what a blessing that is. So he said, the kingdom which he had promised to them that love him. Folks, we can love him and trust him in every situation. And again, how exciting when we think of what God's done and that God has allowed us a special position as his workers, as his, as his soldiers, if you please, in one sense. And then another thought comes to mind. When we think in terms of faith overcomes difficulties, thorns in the flesh become a means of grace through faith. Now, when we talk about that, look over here in you would in 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 12. And I want to refer to this several times through our, our message tonight, if I get through it. 
But here in 2 Corinthians, uh, again, you've got to remember that the Corinthian church was the most worldly church at that time. And of course, when you see what they were saved from and through and everything and realize that they were involved in definitely some very frightening uh, types of religions and so forth. And for them to come to know Christ as Savior was just so amazing. But notice what it says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, Paul uh, was basically considered the author of 14 books of the 27 books of the New Testament. So he did have a lot of revelations, didn't he? Okay, and he says, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. And that thorn in the flesh, it refers to a sickness, a condition, something that maybe perhaps it was his eyesight because in several places he referred to his sight and some of the difficulties that he had because of his eyesight. But uh, we don't know for sure what it was. Uh, many think it was because he'd been beaten so many times. Maybe his body was ridden with all sorts of uh, scar tissue and other things that caused him to be stiff uh, because of all the beatings that he had endured. Uh, and we can just go on and on. I mean, he'd been left for dead several times. And so one thing after another, he'd been shipwrecked, what was it, three times? Uh, he'd been through a lot of things, a lot of heartache, if you please. But whatever it was, we know that he had some sort of thorn in the flesh. And yet he was able to pray and raise people back to life. Wow, that's tremendous prayer, isn't it? And so notice what he says, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And it interested many times in our mind, maybe you picture some sort of cartoon, you know, where they have one shoulder, there's the, the devil there, and then on the other shoulder, there's an angel. And the angel's talking and saying, do this, do this. And then the devil says, no, do this. You know, and it goes back and forth. And if you could picture Paul, many times we think in terms of, well, he had a guardian angel with him, but it says here pretty clearly the messenger of Satan was there to buffet me. <laughs> so he literally had a, a sound like a personal devil or demon that was close to him to keep him, if you please, humble. Lest I should be exalted above measure. How easy it would have been for him to say, hey, I wrote 14 books of the New Testament. How many have you written? <laughs> You see what I'm saying? I mean, and then when you start looking at all the afflictions and all things that he went through, wow. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. So he prayed and asked God to do it very diligently. And he prayed and, and again and again. And finally, it just didn't happen. And God gave him an answer. Verse 9. And he said unto me, referring to Jesus, my grace is sufficient for thee. My grace is sufficient. And folks, what I want to tell you that no matter what you might be going through, his grace is sufficient. And, and too many times we, we'd rather get rid of that problem or that difficulty or whatever you want to call it, Instead, we miss the blessing of having God right there with us, having him present in our life. He said, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So the Lord goes on, he doesn't just say that my grace is sufficient, but he says, in weakness, I am made strong. In other words, weak can become strong when we're physically weak. We can become strong when we're going through affliction and through trials and through testings because we have to lean more on Jesus. We have to trust him to help see us through that situation that we're facing. And folks, it's, it's so exciting when you can feel, wow, God's carrying me. God's seeing me through this. God is extra close to me. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Basically, it's like Paul saying, whatever it takes for Jesus to be close to me, that's what I want in my life. 
Folks, he knew exactly what he was praying for, too. He knew that in one sense it was like he was sticking his tongue out at the devil, going, la, 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 la. <laughs> I'm not going to give in to you and do whatever you want to me. I'm still going to love Jesus. And you're not going to keep me from loving Jesus. And the more you do me, devil, the more I'm going to love him. Wow. Isn't that amazing? To have such a tremendous faith in God. And so his thorns in the flesh, he goes on, verse 10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities. Folks, I don't know about you, but, you know, if I have a flat tire, I don't use it to go, Praise God, I got a flat tire. Oh, mm -hmm. Praise God, I got a wonderful headache. Whoa, man, it's something else. <laughs> you know, or praise God, man, I just broke my leg. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> You know, I mean, seriously, do we do that? It's not very likely that we do. I, we had a friend, uh, well, she's still our friend, and she's mom. Uh, her name was Anel, and she called me one night, and she was laughing and crying at the same time. And she raised some very, very godly children, married one of the preacher boys in our church. And Anel, uh, I said, what's going on? She couldn't hardly talk, and anyhow, Finally, she got it out. She said, well, Rocky called me again. And Rocky was her boyfriend when she wasn't serving God. And Martha, my wife, led her to Christ. And she really got saved, you know. And, and so Rocky was her old boyfriend. And, and anyhow, Rocky wanted to do some really, really bad things with her. Anyhow, it was anything but Christian what he wanted to do to her. And so finally one night he called and he just kept pleading with her. He said, come on my place and let's do this and we'll do that. And she, she said, no, I, I just can't do that, you know? And finally she said, okay, I'm coming. And while she was going, she was thinking in her mind, I, I, I remember what Jerry said when he was preaching, teaching our class and everything. And, and I remember what Martha said and all that. And, and, but, I, I'm just going to go ahead and do it. And, and God, you're going to have to stop me. And sure enough, she had a wreck. <laughs> and she broke her hand. She had a fancy Camaro. Do you know what a Camaro is? It's a fancy car, right? Okay. I saw Sean's hand over there. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it was a very, very nice car she had. And she broke that car. I mean, just totally, you know, pretty well demolished it. And she broke her hand. And anyhow, she got out of the car, got to the phone. And called me. She said, "In God, wonderful. He's so good. God just broke my hand." And then she went into detail explaining everything. But she was excited when she was. She was so excited because she said, "It shows me that God loves me, and God kept me from getting to Rocky. He protected me and loved me by breaking my hand." She said, "It's kind of like you know the Good Shepherd breaking the leg on a sheep, you know, whatever." And as a result, she didn't marry the preacher and had some godly kids. And, you know, we go along well, all the wonderful things that happened. But what I'm saying is, isn't it exciting when you can look and you can see a thing just completely different when everybody's going, what's wrong with she in her head or something? Why is she, why is she so excited and laughing? Look at her car, you know? Look at her hand. Look at her. What's wrong with her? <laughs> it was what was right with her because her relationship with God was right. Never to be changed again because she got life in him. What am I trying to say? That God wants to bless us, that God wants to do special things for us. And so many times we have to go through these, these troubles, through these trials, through these things that we wouldn't test. And, and, and maybe the day come that you'll be able to do just like Adele. Praise God, I wrecked my car and broke my hand. <laughs> and I didn't get the right. Anyhow, what am I saying? It's exciting what God can, what he wants to do for us. Trials will turn into triumphs through faith. And folks, in Romans 8, 37, it says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. So folks, when trials and testings come our way, instead of looking at, oh man, this is terrible, this is awful, this is, this is nothing but trouble, we go, wow, there's victory around the corner. I'm fixing to have victory. And, and, and we can't, can't have victory until there's, if you please, a contest, until there's some sort of trial or testing. Uh, you know, I can tell people, I love to run. I just love to run, and, that, and I, I love to, you know, to, to, to do that. But you know what? Uh, I, 
I just have a hard time getting out there and making my body go. Now that's the truth. I do have a hard time making my body go. But what I'm saying is, how could I ever win a race if I never ran to begin with? How could I ever improve my times if, if I didn't go out there and run and, and work out? How could I, you know, and, and I could just go on down the list all the legs. In other words, we got to go through some trials. We got to go through some testings so we can have triumphs. So we can have victory. And so we can see how God can help us in any situation. In 2 Corinthians 2.14, it says it this way, again, trials will turn into triumphs through faith. It says this, it says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Did you notice what it said? Always causes us to triumph in Christ. Isn't that fantastic? Always. It doesn't say, well, sometimes Jesus will help you to have triumph. Sometimes Jesus will help you have victory. It says he's always there to help us to have victory. Notice, and make it manifest the Savior of his knowledge by us in every place. If we never had anything happen in our life and everything was just fine, and I use the word hunky-dory, okay? I don't know if that's a Texas word or what, but anyhow, <laughs> and everything just seemed to be hunky-dory, everything's okay. Then everybody goes, well, man, I praise God too. If I never had any problems, never had any troubles, or had any difficulties. But then when you and I have problems, if we accept it in a way, well, God knows what he's doing. I don't understand what he's doing, but I don't have to. I just know he loves me. And he's not doing this to be mean to me, but he's doing this for his glory and in one sense for our glory so we can show Jesus off to others. And when we go through those trials and tests, that's when people are going to look at us and they may scratch their head a little bit and say, wow, I know what my husband would have been doing. He'd been cursing and fighting and throwing something through the window and doing all this sort of stuff. But he's not doing that. Yeah. He, he, he acts like maybe, maybe he really is a Christian like they're supposed to be. <laughs> we handle things in a proper way when things are going wrong, Jesus will be in control of our lives. That's the difference. And when Jesus is in control of us, good things can happen. That I can't help but wait. And picking on Richard just a little bit, hadn't picked on much lately, but um, when he got saved, he had a very, very good friend. It was an Elvis impersonator. And I got called in on, on to, to see him, one of our ladies in our church, if I remember, is Teresa Manor. And Teresa said, uh, there's this guy named David, he's the he's a, uh, Elvis impersonator, and there's no preachers coming to see him. And would you come to see him? I asked him if it would be okay, and I said, sure. And as a result, I had the privilege of, at one night, we had 13 adults except Christ as Savior. Now, Richard wasn't in that group, and neither was... Uh, uh, Justin. Who? Justin. Justin, thank you. <laughs> okay, neither was Justin either. But as a result, when we had the funeral service and, and we had a, a meal down below, and of course our church really didn't know him, but we wanted to be a blessing to him. When we had it down below, guess what? I got to lead Richard to Christ and got to lead uh, Justin to Christ too. And that was what, 15 years ago? About 16. 16 years ago. So, I mean, and, how's that? and then on top of that, he accepted Christ too, even he couldn't speak. But he accepted Christ, and it was very apparent he did. And within about an hour, he passed and went to be with the Lord. But what am I trying to say? That was, it, 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 it was a terrible situation, but yet it was a wonderful situation because God received the honor and the glory, and people went to heaven. And people got their lives changed, and when they've never been done that way. Can you imagine your life without Christ, Richard? What would it be like without this church? Well, it, I want to. You know, yeah. It just, but what I'm saying, it's just so amazing how God works, the things that he does, because he does love us and wants us to have a right attitude and spirit. Notice something else as we finish our message. Weakness becomes the sources of strength. 
And again, as I read to you just a moment ago, he says, my strength is made strong in weakness. And I, and, and he says it very, very clearly that his strength, that you can see it in our weakness. You can see the strength of Jesus working through us, helping us to do things that would bring honor to the Lord. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities in reproaches in necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Wow. It's like taking the training wheels off. <laughs> if you've ever had to ride a bicycle with training wheels, you know how frustrating that can be. And it can get quite frustrating because you're trying to but drive or, or ride around, but you're just still limited a little bit. You know what I mean? But when you get rid of those training wheels, wow, it's amazing the things that you can do and uh, the things that you won't do. But when I talk about the Lord in our life, He wants to help us. He wants us to see that He allows these things to come. Not because He's just being mean, because it's not that at all. It's because he loves us and he wants us to grow and he wants us to become stronger in him. So, had any difficulties or any troubles or any trials lately? <laughs> Don't worry, they're coming, okay? They're coming, they're coming maybe sooner than we want. And what I'm saying is we need to learn how to let Jesus help us in our problems and in our difficulties. And see just how close he wants to be to us when we have those difficulties. I can remember when we had our little grandsons at the house. There was times that one would fall or whatever. We, we had several times that uh, literally uh, we had little Luke fell down all our stairs. And it had been in our house and we got a lot of stairs. <laughs> he fell down all those stairs and, and it was just the situation. But when his daddy came and started loving on him, I mean, it was like, oh, it was worth it. I think I'll fall down him again. And he did come to me. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, when we fall down the stairs, Jesus is ready to love on us. Now, we don't fall down the stairs. You know, uh, when I come down the stairs, I, I don't yell back up, hey, Kato, I've made downstairs, okay. Hey, Mom, I made downstairs. Uh, hey, I made downstairs, hey. But if I fall down the stairs and they hear the boom, 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 Dad, are you okay? Dad, and then they all come rushing and see if I'm okay. You know, and I need. Mean, you see what I'm saying? When we go through the falls, that's when, that's when we can feel and know God's presence and know He's there and He loves us and He wants to help us and, and it gives Him an excuse to hug on us. <laughs> okay. Sometimes it seems like we have to have some sort of excuse to, to love them, especially if you got grandsons. You know. I'm a, I'm a tough boy. I'm five years old, granddad. You know, <laughs> but every now and then something happens, and you can take it and you can really love them because, you know, maybe the, the dog snapped at him or something, or a bee got him or whatever. And the bee seemed to really like Jonathan. I didn't think he was that sweet, but I guess he is. But but yeah, what am I saying, folks? You follow me? Had any difficulties, any troubles, any problems? Praise God. I hope we're on the same here. See, that happened too many more ago. Oh, I was supposed to praise God. I remember what I told the people last night. Praise God. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. He loves us. Okay? So, if you would stand to your feet right now, and we'll begin uh, a brief invitation. Lord, thank you for this time. We can study your word and help us to see the importance of yielding to you and seeing our difficulties as opportunities to bless you and for you to bless us. Help us to look at them as a gift, not a problem. Help us to, to see them in such a way that we realize that all the suffering and trials and testings that you went through, which doesn't even come even close to what we've ever gone through. I mean, we've never come near that. And yet you came out praising and with joy through all those trials, because you knew it meant our salvation. Wow. Help us to look at it the same way that you did. For we ask this in your son's precious name. Amen. Okay, folks, God bless you. Looking forward to Sunday. How about y'all? Amen.